This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt back with you for our post-July 1st episode. This is post-July 1st, but before the uh, rookie development camp. And Matt, I wasn't sure what to expect in this episode, if we're going to have a lot of free agent signings or nothing. But, you know, not a lot of free agent signings, but still busy. Yeah, well, Tree got his homework done before class began on July 1st, so... Lots I mean, of moves. <laughs> last year, we saw the big July 1st move, if you will, being the uh, Brower contract. And I think that whether through management or just through fans, that kind of stung a lot of people of, you know what, do we really need a shop that day? And I wonder if that sort of was why Tree wanted to get his business done early. True. And with the Flames having only a couple of holes that they needed to address in the lineup, it allowed them to be addressed quickly, easily, re-signing a couple of players, making a trade for a backup. So just getting all the little things done early so that way you don't need to overpay or get in, into any stupid problems. <laughs> well, let's go through these sort of category by category, and then we'll have some discussions. The first thing is the two re-signings. There was two players the Flames need to re-sign, or more of them, but two UFAs the Flames really need to re-sign. Michael Stone, they got the deal done. We weren't sure if that would happen now that Hamannick was here. Stone signed a three-year, $10.5 million deal, which is going to be roughly a $3.5 million cap hit. And Christopher Stieg re-signed here at one year, $1.75 million. So um, a raise for Versteeg, a little bit of a drop for Stone, but I'm happy with both guys and their contracts. How about you? Yeah, and now if you look at it, Hamannick and Stone replace Englund and Weidman for a cheaper cap hit and what? significantly higher talent. So for sure. that's a and win. Remember that we were also paying Laddie Smead. True, but he wasn't really in the lineup, so long-term injury reserve guy. So would you rather have Hamannick and Stone, or would you rather have you know England and let's say Weidman? Give me a break. Is there you any know, discussion there? Uh, no. Well, I know you were I, I would fan. honestly I would rather have Hamannick or Stone and Anders Ericsson in his current form than Weidman and England. So, so I know I think you were... you'd have a better overall group with Anders Ericsson than you would with either of those two guys, so yeah, I mean, it's an expensive contract for a number five defenseman at 3.5, but we have to remember that this gives the Flames a lot of flexibility. Should there be an injury in the top four, we know that Stone is capable to step in and move up into that top four spot, and we're pretty well assured that he's going to do a good job. It's not like we're bringing Bartkowski in to play top four minutes. Yeah, and like realistically, if you look at it, Hamannick is going to be the PK specialist, and Stone's going to be the power play specialist. Each will probably end up playing roughly the same minutes, five on five. So overall, you're going to be getting like 20 minutes a night from all five of the guys. So it's just figuring out all the little details. But Stone, you know, that he'll be sheltered a bit. So, you know, it, it works. And if he does recover fully from his injury, then... Like, we're laughing, basically. Well, and that was going to be a question I was going to ask you as well, Matt. So, I mean, we don't know who Stone's partner is going to be. We're kind of assuming internally it'll probably be Kulak. But yeah, just pencil that name in, and unless Anderson or Shillington blow the doors off in training camp, then that'll be who it is. So, I mean, looking at those pairings, you've got Giordano Hamilton, you've got Brody Hamannick, and you've got Stone Kulak. On a good night, you could almost just um, roll the defensive pairs. Mm -hmm. You know, you're probably not going to worry so much about who gets how much time. You, to me, you can put out any one of those pairings, and you're probably going to have success. Yeah, especially against like the average to below average teams, you're not really going to be too worried if Stone and Kulak are out there at any point. 
like if you're playing against Chicago or something like that, you're going to be paying a lot more attention to on ice management. But yeah, it gives that flexibility instead of having to force to be playing Weidman in England and Yoki Paka or you know any of the miscellaneous guys that we had filling in last year. Well, especially if you can get up, like you know, if we can go into a third period up by two, you know three or four goals, you might roll those a little bit more and. The other nice thing I think about that is Kulak really hasn't had a lot of NHL exposure. So putting him on a pairing with Stone full-time, I think that's going to be a great way to see if he can develop into something full-time or not. Yeah, and the metrics show that Kulak was actually a fairly good defenseman in his own right. Just wasn't, he was being sheltered, obviously, but, you know, not really sure what's there in terms of his upside yet so getting to see him will be interesting for sure um and you know you'd mentioned anderson and shillington there the two i'd say top defensemen in stockton before this season i think it was probably a shoe in we all thought that one of them would make the jump to the nhl but what I like about this move is it does buy them some time. I'm not sure either one's quite ready for a top six role yet, and we don't need to rush them into the lineup now. If they can beat Kulak, there's yeah. an established, this is what the NHL defenseman is. If you do better than this, you're in. If you don't, we're fine to develop you for another year. Yeah, and it's not going to hurt either one of them to play in Stockton another year. And if there are injuries, like more than a game or two type injury one of those two guys will come in like uh, there's no argument like on who will get in it'll be one of those two guys and it then they'll get their opportunity to shine and i wouldn't be shocked if either of them gets 10 plus games next year depending on severity of injuries so you know it, it's all good like the flames are making sure that they're not putting themselves in a position where they need ifs and maybes like if anderson can perform then we might be good like you've got five guys that are good you don't have to worry about them so now it's just a matter of seeing what the rest of them have and let them sort everything out on the ice you and I were talking recently with Ryan Pike from the Hockey Writers. A lot of people know him from Flames Nation. And he was pretty much saying the same thing. You know, he said he thinks they'll bring Bartkowski in as number seven. But, you know, he's there in case, say, there's a back-to-back or they just can't get a guy in from Stockton fast enough, then he plays. But as you were just mentioning, should somebody get hurt long-term, Bartkowski probably doesn't become the slot in. It's pull up a guy from the farm, Shillington Anderson, and give them that time. Yeah, and it makes sense because Barkowski's contract is dirt cheap, so you might as well have him as the number seven because you're even just ha- having him on the bench is saving money versus having either one of them on the entry-level contract, so why not? Yeah, and, and I mean, as we become a contender, I think we're going to see roster management being done differently than it has been in the past when we haven't been. You know, you've just been, okay, we'll see some call-ups after the deadline. But I think if the Flames are looking at themselves as a contender, which the moves they've made would lead me to believe that they are, I think there's that fine balance between when do we bring kids up long-term versus how do we audition them in an injury scenario or something like that. And I think it's going to be there's going to be more creativity needed as we have more guys in Stockton ready to potentially make that jump. And how do we evaluate them? Matt, the other signing that was made here, not on the blue line, but on the forward side, the flames bring back one of their uh, veteran players from last year. The one that we got cheap, Chris Versteeg resigns with the flames. To me, I see nothing but upside to this. Versteeg is a good veteran guy. He can work with a lot of young players. He's supposed to be really great in the room. I was saying to you I would do this as long as there's less than $2 million and the Flames got that done. I'm glad they didn't do more than one year because we know that Versteeg had some injury problems last year. But yeah, because like if, yeah, like if Versteeg does have, run into those injury problems, then you can just put him on the IR and you, know, you can just sort out the roster spot then. So it's no harm. It's not like you've got him for three or four years where if he gets like a catastrophic injury, then you've got to have long-term IR space for 
the rest of his contract. Yeah, and he's only 31, so he's a fairly young player. So I can see him being around here for a while. But I think just until we know if he's injury prone still or not, he's going to be on a couple one year deals for the next few. But I like Versteeg. I was glad we signed him last year. I'm glad he's coming back. In the playoffs, especially, I thought that Versteeg was one of the hardest workers for the Flames. So if we're looking to be a contender, you need veteran guys. And Versteeg's a guy with a ring. I think this is a great pickup. Yep. I have no complaints. It's a necessary signing. It, he can slot up and down the lineup depending on injuries, slumps, you name it. So it works. And, you know, he's a, he's a right winger, which we need. And I think that, you know, if he ends up playing with either Bennett or Jankowski, he's going to be a good sort of mentor for either one of those players. I agree. Last episode you and I did, we were talking about the goaltending. We knew that Mike Smith was going to be the Flames' starting goaltender. What we didn't know was what would they were going to do for a backup. And we talked about, do we try to bring somebody in? Do we bring someone up from the farm? Shortly after we recorded that, Trilliving answered that question for us. The Flames made a trade with the Carolina Hurricanes. The Calgary Flames acquired Eddie Lack, Ryan Murphy, and a 2019 seventh-round pick. And in exchange, we traded... Keegan Kanzig's rights, and the 2009 sixth-round pick. So Eddie Lack is now a Calgary Flame. He will likely be the backup goaltender this year. And just as an interesting note I looked up here, Eddie Lack recorded his first Stanley Cup playoff victory on April 17, 2015, with a 4-1 to victory over the Flames. That's when he was a Vancouver Canuck. Um, Matt, I know that people are polarizing Eddie Lack. What are your thoughts on Lack? Well, Lack, when he went to Carolina, uh, former Flames goalie coach uh, Mar David Marcoux was uh, the Hurricanes goalie coach, and he got him to play a completely different style further out of the, the net than he was comfortable with, and he struggled for almost the entire season with it, and his numbers were absolutely terrible, and he got... After a game in March, he got called out by the head coach of the Hurricanes, and he changed how he played, basically reverting back to how he was comfortable playing, and he put up stellar numbers again and helped Carolina push for a playoff spot last year. So, you know, it, it depends. Like, if we're getting the March on Eddie Lack, then, hey, we got a great backup. Awesome, let's go. If we're getting the, you know, before March, <laughs> Eddie Lack, then uh, prepare to see either Gillies or Riddich in the lineup start October. You know, when I look at Eddie Lack, we saw a lot of him in Vancouver being that they're a rival, and he was a pretty promising young goaltender when he was in Vancouver. I remember everyone looking around going, you know what, this could be their goalie of the future, and that was when they were going through the whole, you know, Luongo Schneider thing and not really sure what they wanted to do. And I thought yeah. he he was a great backup. I think he went to Carolina and maybe he's not cut out to be a, you know, a number 1 goaltender. I think very similar to Chad Johnson, he's a great backup and that's what I like about this. Is he's a guy we know when he plays limited minutes, he's very good. Yeah, and I think that playoff series against the Flames, uh, the the Sea of Red kind of got to him, I think, a bit uh, during that playoff run. And uh, I, I remember participating in those Eddie chants. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, I think he'll be happy to be on the other side of that. <laughs> For sure. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, you were talking about how Eddie Lack had changed his game and then changed back. And to me, what that shows is a great deal of versatility. That, you know, he's one of these guys that can take suggestions. He's open to change, whether it's for the best, for the worst. You do what the coaches tell you to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about this. I've always liked Eddie Lack. I thought that maybe he was in the wrong situation when he was in Carolina. But I think this is a great signing. He's only got, what, a two-year deal? Um, yeah. Yeah, one so, year, so one point three seven five million. So he, I mean, we're paying him less than Versteeg. So if things work out, you resign him. If they don't, hopefully this will, you know, basically move yeah. on from and have a goalie ready in the A. But if nothing else, it buys us a year, which I think we need. 
Exactly. And then, like you were mentioning with Kulak, Lack is the, okay, You to both Gillies, Riddich, and Parsons, this is the guy you have to beat. Be better than him, it, the spot's yours. So, especially in training camp, if Lack is lacking, for a better term, then, you know, it'll give both Gillies and Riddich a spot to say, hey, I'd like that, you know, this is what I can do instead. So Yeah, and it's going to be a motivator uh, both ways. Eddie Lack doesn't want to go to the AHL, so he has to make sure that he's giving us his best effort. And the guys yeah. in the AHL don't want to stay in the AHL, so they're going to have to give us their best effort. So I think it's really going to motivate on both sides. Yeah, and if you have to bury a $1.375 million contract, like that's nothing. Like Your cap hit's only like 400 and change on that verse you know like if you were having to bury a three or four million dollar contract so no big deal either way yeah but i mean just looking assuming that that's our goaltending tandem for the year i'm happy with that i think mike smith is a good veteran goalie i think eddie lack at 29 there's still some some figuring out there as to what exactly we've got but i mean we know from his numbers he's a capable nhl goalie um, I don't think he's going to get that much work this coming year, which I think is good. And the thing I'm most happy about is it buys us time. We know the goaltenders develop slowly. I'm not convinced that Riddich or Gillies is ready yet. So this, if nothing else, just buys us at least a year, probably two, to figure out what we want to do. Yep. So, and that's the important thing. And just got to wait and see on the kids and how they're doing and figure it out. And then a minor trade the Calgary Flames made. They acquired goaltender Tom McCollum last year from the Detroit Red Wings, really for no other reason than he was a goalie under contract. And we needed that for the expansion draft because we didn't have either of our NHL goaltenders under contract and our AHL goaltenders didn't qualify to be protected. Uh, The Flames traded McCollum back to the Red Wings for a conditional seventh round pick. I don't think we know what that condition is yet. It's probably... Probably, like, if he turns into Dominic Hasek and becomes their starting goaltender, then we get a seventh round pick. But until then, yeah, nothing. It's sort of like uh, Max Reinhardt and uh, Freddie Hamilton, those trades where it was a conditional late round pick and neither one of them, the condition was met, so neither team got anything for it. Do you remember what we originally gave up from McCollum? Honestly, I have no clue. I think we might have just signed him as a free agent, actually. Uh, you're right, we did. Two-year, two-way contract. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, that's probably fair. We gave up nothing for him, so we're probably going to get nothing back. That makes sense. Um, anything else to say about either trade? Yeah, just roster filling it out, and that's all. So, no big deal. So... The next day, or shortly after, if not the next day, the Calgary Flames made two buyouts, and this was kind of shocking to people. The Calgary Flames bought out Ryan Murphy, who was the defenseman acquired in the Carolina trade, and apparently Carolina wouldn't have done that trade without Ryan Murphy being included. Some people even said that the buyout was a condition of the trade. Um, And they also bought out longtime Flames winger Lance Boma. And Boma has been here for a while. We were saying on this show quite a bit he was overpaid, so he's been bought out. This coming season, his cap hit as a buyout will be 666000 and the year after, 766000 So probably nothing to say about um, Ryan Murphy, but your thoughts on the Boma move? Well, looking at the $2.2 million that he was owed, you know, like, saving like one and a half million dollars for this year it helps significantly like i know that uh, some people were thinking that they might buy out staging as well but you weren't going to save as much money so it wasn't really viable in that regard and but boma like if you're only paying six hundred thousand dollars to get rid of that contract that's not bad and instead of the 2.2 so you know i i was kind of expecting them to buy bulma out it sucks that he's gone and i wish him the best in chicago and that's about it like i hope that he has a bounce back season and 
can earn another contract, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, to me, though, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, Bowman was here for a while, but it was his contract to lose. You know, they gave him all the chances they could. He signed a big deal after he had a great season. Bowman hasn't looked great, and to me, he hasn't, with so many young players, he hasn't played himself into an NHL spot with the Flames. No. and It's not that like they caught a guy that deserved to be here or, like, a salary dump. Yeah, well, he was injured repeatedly ever since he signed the contract, and that's where the problem. And when you've got guys like Shin Carrick, Klimchuk, Manjapani, Poirier, Jankowski, Hathaway, Lomberg, all vying for the that kind of a roster spot, Lazar, like it, it, you know, you've got seven, eight, nine guys that could play his spot. Well, why are you going to spend two and a half? or 2.2 million on him when you can spend nine hundred thousand dollars on any of the other guys instead like it, it just saves that little bit of extra money so that way you can sign free agents and have more versatility at the trade deadline yeah and you know looking at that spot on the roster i mean it's likely that he would have probably been a fourth line center this year would you agree if that that's an easy position to fill if he's going to be, you know, your your extra forward. $2 million is a lot of money to spend on the extra forward. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like when the Flames bought out Mason Raymond. You know, like Raymond probably could have played in the NHL. But, you know, it, the at the money he was getting paid, not really. So My guess, Mason Raymond for Team Canada at the next Olympics. Well, we'll see. I I wouldn't be shocked if a bunch of players just said, "Ah, eh, the hell with it. I'm going anyway." So, so just for the sake of completeness, the Calgary Flames have three buyouts on the books this year. This will be the final year of the Mason Raymond penalty. So remember, these aren't money that they necessarily owe, but they're penalized against the cap. So they're penalized one point oh five million dollars for Raymond. Let's round down to a million. Uh, Boma is six hundred sixty-six thousand, and Ryan Murphy's a hundred thousand. So three, you know, three uh, hits there. Really, the three of them together is less than what we're paying a guy like Versteeg. So that's a pretty manageable number against your your cap. Yeah, and that's probably a big reason why they didn't want to buy Stage Note either. Is next year they they would have probably a couple million dollars that they wouldn't be able to spend. Precisely, and especially with. Uh... Some of the contracts, like Backland, his uh, contract extension that I'm sure will be coming eventually, it, you know, that'll kick in next year, so you don't want to have a bunch of wasted space on the books. Yeah, I'd have to do the exact math, but just quick in my head, I think that if we were to buy out stage and it would be about $2 million a year. Uh, uh, it was 1.5 and 1.8, if I recall okay. correctly. Something yeah. like that, it, in that ballpark. This this is like from when I looked it up like a month and a half ago. You could so. sign Versteeg for that next year. Pretty much. So those are the two buyouts, neither one shocking. Uh, I don't think the Flames had any desire for Ryan Murphy. It sounded like they had to take him to get the lack deal done. And that was part of Carolina trying to shed salary as well. Yep. Yeah. So let's move on then chronologically to free agency, the flame signing free agents. And were you, were you glued to the TV watching free agent frenzy on TSN? No, <laughs> not I at all. I feel bad for those guys. It's like trade deadline day. They're sitting there all day at their desk and halftime. They have nothing to talk about and they have to, you know, find something to talk about. for. Oh, eight, random fourth hours. liner guy signed with some team. Yay. That's exciting. Or they're recapping what happened last year. Yeah. Um, so the flames did make some moves, both players in and players out, but nothing that was earth shattering on July 1st. The Spencer foo contract officially came into being. We talked about him in the last show. Um, this is a college free agent that the Flames signed. And we made two small signings, I believe one on July 1st and one shortly after. The first f signing that the Flames made on July 1st was Merrick Horivik, who comes from the, uh, from the uh, Rangers organization. He's been playing in the AHL since about 2011, 2012. He's had a couple looks. He played 16 games for the Rangers in 2016, 2017, but nothing really earth shattering so this is just a depth forward signing he's a winger centerman six foot two 205 pounds 
good depth guy to go to Stockton yeah. and maybe Derek that Grant call two point oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's your he's your depth veteran guy. And it looks like the Flames want to make a run with Stockton this year. So you're gonna need a couple vets down there. The other player that the Flames signed was Luke Gadzik, who a lot of people know here from the Oilers organization. He played with New Jersey most recently. Um, this is a big, tough player, six foot four, two twenty-five. He can play either wing from Toronto, twenty-seven year old. To me, again, never going to see the NHL. This guy is just there as your muscle in Stockton. He's replacing, I think, uh, Brandon Bolig. Yep. Nothing really much to say there. No, and a couple Flames who departed the team. You mentioned that shortly after the Flames bought out Lance Boma, he got signed by the Chicago Blackhawks, which I was kind of surprised he got signed so quickly. Um, Brandon Bolig went to the San Jose Sharks and a prospect who we didn't make an offer to and we lost was Steven Falkowski, who has departed to go to LA as a free agent. Matt, you, you're really our prospect expert. What do you think of the Flames losing Falkowski? Well, it's one of those things. He did have a lot of goals last year in the ECHL and he wanted an entry level contract and the Flames were just wanting him to be on an AHL contract and they just disagreed on where he was at and LA was quick to sign him. You know, I'm hoping that it won't be a move that comes back to bite them, but who knows? It, you know, I was a little disappointed that they let him go, but that's life. It happens. You know, uh, basically the way I'm looking at it is we got Fu, we lost Falkowski, we came out ahead. Well, that's it. In, of, in the end, it all evens out. If you look at you know, the number of free agent, I mean, you know, we've signed free agents in the past who weren't expected to do anything, like Riddich. We've signed free agents that were expected to do something and didn't, like Wolf. That's why you have seven draft picks every year. And Falkowski was the seventh round pick in 2016. Generally, when you're drafted that highly, you're not expected to do a whole lot. And, you know, you were mentioning he got a lot of goals last year. He had 21 goals in 54 games for 32 total points in Adirondack. The ECHL is a pretty goal friendly league. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> It is I what it is. Like, I don't I, see Falkowski ever becoming, you know, a pinnacle player for L.A., and even if he ends up being a fourth-line player there, I don't think that we could say that we, you know, are sad we lost him. Those guys are a dime a dozen. Yeah, exactly. Like, it sucks, but, yeah, kind of underwhelmed either way. <clears throat> but, you know, good for the Flames for standing padded and saying this is, you know, what we're going to offer you, and if he thinks he can get better, which he did, Great. I personally don't think you'll get a second contract from LA, but you know, maybe they're just looking to f to fill up some farm depth as well. So a pretty quiet free agency, no big contract signed. Um, but looking at the roster now, as all this shook down, there's still some suggestion that maybe the Flames are missing one piece, and that one piece being a right winger. Um, there's been some rumors, there's been fans talking a lot about, you know, should the Flames bring back a Ginla? Should they bring in Doan? Should they bring in Yager? Should they just stand pat organizationally? All three of those veterans are still available. Now, if you were the GM of this team, what would you be doing at this point? Oh, well, I'd be kicking the tires on Yager for sure. Um, Apparently Yager be, thinks he can play another 10 years. Yeah, and honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if he did. He was great last year, so... Give him you a 10-year deal. When he's 54, you can put a little AstroTurf outside his stall so the kids can get off his lawn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, but uh, with Yager being a Panthers fan, like of course he doesn't have the wheels that he used to, but uh, he's a very smart player and definitely lethal on the power play. So, See, you know. I think I think that's the key there. We're not going to get either any of those three veterans as a number one right winger on a team that's looking to contend. You know, yeah. Yager's not well, going to come in and play number one minutes and be fantastic at it. But I think if you look at him as a depth uh, forward, maybe you pair him up with Jankowski or Bennett, I think that he could have some good effects for the team. Yeah, and, like, you could put him on the first line. Like, he's not slow, slow, but... Yeah, you know, it, he's not slow, it's, slow, but I think with the speed we have there, he would maybe hold those guys back a bit. Yeah, 
It, it all depends. Like everything, it just depends. And, you know, like, I, I wouldn't even be shocked if the Flames just decide to go into the season standing pat. And you gotta figure that they'll have about three and a half million once they resign all their RFAs. So if you extrapolate that to the deadline, they could go out and get a veteran forward or two. And like if you look at what people spent last year at the trade deadline for players, it was ridiculous. So so it's one of those things that it you could just go out and get anybody basically at the trade deadline for like a third or fourth round pick and you know we've already shed so many draft picks what's another one or two if like say guys like Jankowski who are vying for a spot do not actually live up to expectations for sure I think that that's a good way to go if I was the GM here I think I'd stand pat with the forwards I have I think the forward core is good enough um, and then, like you said, add either the deadline or throughout the season if you think there's a deal to be made. Another thing I was thinking, if you look at the Flames system right now, we have six pro goalies. We have Mike Smith, Eddie Lack, uh, David Riddich, John Gillies, and Tyler Parsons, and Mason McDonald. So six professional goaltenders there. If I'm the GM, I might be looking to see if I can move one of those pieces because there's going to be a logjam to find them all places to work and maybe get a right winger in that way. You're not going to get a first line winger in that way, but you might, I just don't think we'd be trading you know, enough goaltenders to get a first line winger, but it might give us a little bit more depth on the wing. Yeah. I think you're just robbing from Peter to pay Paul at that point. And you know, it's not really going to help you much. Like you can always just loan Mac Mason McDonald out to some other ECHL team and solve that problem that way. Oh, and then Tyler Parsons, I forgot as well. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking like if you could move, let's say there's an organization who is weak on goaltending. I'd have to look through the, you know, everyone's rosters, see who is. And they're looking for, you know, their three, four guy for a, for the A. You might be able to get someone's depth forward. Someone like a Curtis Lazar type player has been passed over in another market and might be able to come in here and not necessarily jump to the first line, but have some success with a new environment and new line mates. Um, that's how I would, if the Flames want to approach in the off season, that's the way I would go about it is I would try to trade. And really, I mean, we're running out of assets to trade. So the only thing I can think that we would trade would be a goaltender. I don't think it's necessary, but I just don't know that any one of those three big veteran um, guys is the right answer at this point. Yeah, And people have been asking me every day since July 1st, when are the Flames going to make a move? When are the Flames going to make a move? I think for me, the biggest thing that they're going to do first, and if I was the GM, is get their RFA signed. So like you were mentioning, we know how much money we have left to spend. Um, there's a bunch of RFAs they probably want, but I think the biggest two are going to be Bennett and Furland. Matt, any ideas on what you think? Let's start with Bennett. What do you think that contract's going to look like? Well, just basing it off of similar guys in the past, like they all got around two and a half to three million dollars a year. So I'm expecting like a two, three year deal in that ballpark. So give him Boma's money. More or less. And Furland probably in the one and a half to two million dollar range. See, I'm looking even in our own team here. You've got Michael Backlund making three and a half. I think that that alone is going to make Bennett command a little bit more. I'm expecting Bennett's probably going to be about a three for three. Three years, three million dollars. Yeah, that's um, possible. Furland has filed for arbitration, which he's allowed to do. And for those that don't know, if the team and the player can't reach a settlement by a date, usually it's late July, it's probably coming up here pretty soon, then they go to the league and the league looks at the player, they look at similar players, and the league comes up with, this is a one-year contract, you have to pay this guy this much. And the team can either take the contract or walk away from the player and he becomes a, an unrestricted free agent. We don't see that too often, but I think the Flames would like to avoid arbitration here. Um, I think if the Flames are looking at Furland to be on that first line, I don't know that you're going to get away with him at less than $2 million. I think we're probably going to see Furland coming in about 2 2.5. That would be on the upper end of things. I'm thinking like one seven five would probably I'd, I'd be. I'd like to get him in under 2. I think it's also going to depend how long you sign him for. 
I would be okay to sign for like three, four years at less than two million because you can always find a spot for a guy at that much money. Yeah. But if we're going to sign him over two, I wouldn't be comfortable. I mean, I don't want a Boma scenario where two years from now, you and I are sitting here saying they bought out Michael Furland. Um, if he needs to do more than two, I would not want to go with, you know, a, a two or th- two years I could do. I wouldn't want to go more than two at two. Yeah. How do you I feel agree. about it? I agree. And I think the interesting thing with Bennett, too, is Michael Backlund's contract is up for renewal after this season. I think Bennett is going to directly affect the Backlund contract as well, so that's something that we have to look at. But, I mean, if you look that Stajan's $3 million will be off the books, it gives us money to play with for both guys. Um, any other RFAs? Let's look at another RFA who might be in the NHL, which is Lazar. What do you think Lazar is going to get? Probably a million bucks. Easy, cheap, quick. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Might be 1.2 or 1.3, but not really anything to get upset by. And we talked about it last show a little bit. Uh, Alex Chason did not get qualified. The Flames said they might offer him a deal, but they just didn't want him to be able to go to arbitration and things like that. So he's not an RFA. Do you see Chason coming back? I doubt it. I think Lazar's taking his spot. Yeah. Um, any other RFAs you think the Flames might spend some significant change on or you want to talk about? Not really. I know Brett Kulak's an RFA, but I don't see that being a no. high-dollar contract, probably under a million bucks for a David, year. And David Riddich is. He'll be under a million bucks. Yeah. So Half like all, under a million. Yeah. Uh, so, like, nothing really expensive on any front. The only other it's one that might be interesting. It's just a matter of getting them done. Yeah. The only other one that might be interesting is the Gillies contract. Yeah, I don't even see that being too expensive. Probably just around a million dollars for yeah, like I, a one-year deal. I could even see them going, you know, one point one, one point two with a two-way on it. Yeah, um, yeah. Or I like think... the old audio contract where this year it's a two-way deal and next year it's a one-way deal or something like that. You know, with all these clauses and you know all this stuff on contracts, I'm so glad I'm not the guy who has to manage all that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with you about Brett Kulak. I think that he'll probably get one, I'd say 1.5 at the upper limit. And really, if we're sitting then at about three, three and a half to sign other players, there's not a lot of room to go free agent shopping after that. No. Unless so. you can get Yager for like two and a half or three million, then, you know, like that's about it. Like I wouldn't sign any of the other guys for at all. No, well, we, don't, we don't have any money. Yeah. So, is there anything more at this point before training camp that you feel like the Flames have to add? I mean, you're always going to be kicking tires. You're always going to be seeing what's out there. But if you're the GM, is there any position or certain player that you're going hard on? That when you're looking right now at the UFA class, you're saying, we need this guy. Yager, and that's basically it. Like it, That would be the only guy that I'd be actually fighting to sign. Just because you know that he's going to probably get around 40 to 50 points regardless. And, you know, you can always use that in your lineup. I think and two years ago, if you and I were sitting here talking about Yermer Yager coming to the Flames, we think it was a bad idea because it's an old guy taking a contract spot. But as you move into being a contender, look at any contender. They always have those old grizzled vets in their lineup. And like you said, he's still probably good for 30 to 50 points, depending on who you put him with. You need a guy like that if you're going to contend. Yeah, because, hey, you know, goals are important, and, <laughs> you know, you kind of need some to win. So, and you know what? The Flames love their theme nights. If Yager comes, they can do mullet night. Exactly. And you can get the traveling Yagers to come to the Dome and hang out. Perfect. There we go. Now we got someone to chill at the Dome with. You'll find me in the Dome chilling with the traveling Yagers. Yep. Um, so if, if Yager comes, everyone has to go and buy their wigs. Yep, and their Yager jerseys and... I bet we would see a lot of Yager jerseys in the stands. Oh, of course, because it's like, well, we even saw a bunch of Cujo jerseys back in the day when he played here for that little bit. Well, and I've talked to a lot of people who've said they don't think that the Flames jerseys are significant enough to buy a new jersey for their favorite player. They're not going to go buy a new Johnny or Monty or any of those guys. But I think Yager would get you some new jersey sales. Oh, yeah, for sure. I can't see a lot of people buying a Lack or a Smith jersey. I can't. Maybe Hamanek will sell. Um, but, yeah, I think Yager would sell you some new jerseys. 
So Matt, as of now when we record this in July, looking at this team, this roster, looking at everyone else in our division, have the Flames done what they need to do to establish themselves as a contender on paper? Looking at all the other teams in the Western Conference, the deepest organization of them all is the Calgary Flames. When you're saying organization, you're talking just the NHL or the entire 50-man rosters? Well, probably both, actually, because we do have a bunch of good young players that are ready to come up to the NHL as well. So, yeah, sure, why not? And, you know, the Flames, on paper, are the best team in the West. I think if we look at the Pacific Division especially, we've definitely got the best blue line. Yeah. Like, you, if you look at our division... Uh, Vegas is going to be terrible. Arizona, they've made improvements, but they're still terrible. Uh, Vancouver is getting worse, not better. Los Angeles is kind of in the we're not really sure what we're doing anymore mode because a guy like Kopitar had such a bad year last year that you don't know if he's that's it for him or what's going on. You have San Jose who lost Marlowe and didn't replace him with anything and... You know, 27 goals out of the lineup is a hard pill to swallow. So they, they've gotten worse. So that just leaves Anaheim and Edmonton. Edmonton is arguably worse than they were two weeks ago, let alone, you know, since the end of the season. They haven't improved. And Anaheim, they're a year older. And they didn't really improve either. So, you know, it's one of those things that there's only one team in our division that got significantly better and that's ours and we weren't far off from being one of the best teams in the division and like if we didn't have such a terrible start last year we probably would have won the division so you know add everything together and i think the flames are either going to finish first or second in the western conference and it'll be fun yeah, I think Anaheim is still a team that at least for another year you've still got to be worried about. I don't, yeah, they're older, but they've still got a heck of a roster there. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm not saying they're bad. It's just they didn't get better. And I think you're going to see Anaheim, Calgary competing for number one in the division. Edmonton will be number two. And probably L.A. shortly after that. I think Vancouver's gotten worse. Arizona's gotten worse. San Jose's gotten worse. And you throw Vegas in there now too. And they're, I mean, they're going to be at the bottom. You're not going to be worse than Vegas in the division. No. Well, Vancouver might, because, you know, Vancouver is (laughs) bad, but you know, yeah. Like I, I think this year, what you'll end up seeing is five teams from the central division being in the playoffs and three from the Pacific only. Interesting. Yeah. Could be. You think think, you think all the wild cards will be central? Yeah. And yeah, they got a they got a lot of good teams. I'm glad we're not in the Central Division. Yeah, so you know it's one of those situations where it'll be interesting. I think that the Flames will they're definitely poised to make a run for things and be an actual legitimate contender. And now it's just a matter of seeing how things shake out when the season starts. For sure. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for our early January episode. Our next episode we'll put out will be some thoughts of ours after the Flames Rookie Development Camp, which happened at Windsport in early July. And then we probably won't talk to anyone until you know mid to late August unless the Flames go out and do something big. So everyone have a great summer. Uh, look for one more episode in the next week or so here. And... Um, otherwise it's, I'm excited. Like usually I'm not excited in July, but I'm excited for the hockey season to start. Well, that, back in uh, January when the flames were kind of waffling, uh, I remember opening the show saying that I was looking forward to seeing what the flames were going to do in the off season. And basically what happened was what I was hoping for. So I'm just looking forward to, to september and october and like let's drop the puck and let's go (laughs) well that's it we've got a great roster assembled let's just do this let's uh you know let's move on and let's see what we can do with this roster and i just yeah i want to get them on the ice and see this i'm excited for the start of the season uh is it september yet come on let's go (laughs) are we there yet are we there yet 
Come on. All right, Matt. All right, Matt. I'll <laughs> talk to you again uh, when we get to the rookie development camp. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.